Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 22 to verse 34. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We we met in the priority areas office. Yes, that's right, we did. Um, There was a meeting. But, uh, and then we discovered we had mutual friends and actually probably knew each other years and years ago. <laughs> but both of us have changed significantly yeah. and we don't remember each other from then. Um, but obviously we got to know each other more here. Mm, yeah. And are you, are you officially one of the elders? I am. I am, yes. I'm, I was probably about a year after St George's Tron was, was kind of on its feet. I was one of the people that, that officially joined the church. I was one of the 12 that stood up that Easter Sunday and said, right, this is now my church. Um, and yes, I'm now on, on the Kirk Session, uh, part of the leadership team. Uh, I'm also a trustee of the Wild Olive Tree Cafe. Uh, yeah, this is my this is my spiritual home. Yeah, so you know, you know this place inside out. Oh, I wouldn't quite say that. There's some <laughs> unexplored corners, but, but yes. So I thought it might be quite interesting to have a conversation with some of these words. And, and there's, there's words that have that get used and sometimes overused. <laughs> yes, there's some interesting words in there, but like, let me tell you how I feel about that one. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to put two together actually. Yep. I'm going to start with these two. Uh-huh. So, peace and scared. So, I've chosen those two uh, because Right at the start of this, when I was diagnosed with with breast cancer um, at the start of January, I was terrified. I mean, really proper scared. Like, I remember remember sitting in my living room and and having to phone. I tried to tell some people in person, but others I had to phone. And I remember that throughout the month of January, I would have moments where I would actually just find myself starting to shake. And I couldn't really explain why I was shaking. Um, but my breast care nurse, who's been fantastic all the way through this, you know, she taught me through this. It's, like, it's normal. You're you're in shock, really. Um, so I was very scared at the beginning, and I remember that one of the things in January, bef- before I'd started any treatments, people would say, "What can we be praying for?" And and of course, many people immediately are like, "We're going to be praying for healing." And I was like, "Great, super." But actually, what I asked for, it wasn't that I didn't want people to pray for healing for me, but I knew at that point what I needed was, I needed peace. And I needed courage. Courage makes me think of... The B word. The B word. <laughs> brave. If anybody kind of thinks, oh, I've used that word. I've told you I think you're brave. Please do not think that I am judging you for saying that. <laughs> However, I have, I have found myself really having to examine that word and think, when people have said, do you know you're so brave? You know, I'm not brave for turning up to the hospital and letting them stick needles in me. I have no choice. If I want to get better, I have to turn up and I have to let them do that. So so brave was a difficult word for me because I haven't felt worthy of it. However, I'm beginning to sort of think, think it through and 
become a little bit reconciled to it. I suppose I kind of think about it from the, the point of view of, it's the same when they talk about the word courage. No, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's, it's having the, the ability to, to be frightened but face the thing that you're going through anyway. And I suppose brave could apply to that too from the point of view of it, it's, it's not that it's nothing, but it's that you're facing it regardless. Yeah, brave's been a challenging word. I have not felt particularly brave, but I accept that actually, yeah, it means letting go and letting God. So. Right, so um, over that one. <laughs> well, follow, following on from the brave thing, that, that was one of the things I say that people quite often, I, I didn't, they give you an NHS prescription for a wig. And I went and I got the wig fitted. And it was a lovely wig. And as one of my friends said, you look like having your, you're having your best hair day ever. I know that it made me look normal for other people, but I didn't feel like me when I wore it. So without it, as long as I didn't catch sight of myself in a mirror, I felt like me. Whereas when I wore it, I felt like I was wearing this hot, itchy hat. Oh, okay. And it just didn't, and I don't normally wear a hat, so it felt quite unnatural. So, future's an interesting one. Undergoing treatment, it was very hard to think of the future. And partly it's hard to think of the future because during cancer treatment, during chemotherapy certainly anyway, your world shrinks down to a three week cycle. The future is about, well, surgery will be coming after this. And then once you get to surgery, then it's about, well, radiotherapy's coming, coming after that. And if I started to think beyond that, I just had this sense of, I, I can't do it. I can't really think beyond that. Um, and actually, you know, for all that there are good survival statistics for breast cancer, there's also quite worryingly high statistics for the number of people for whom it comes back or metastasizes. At that time, all I could think of was, well, do you know what? It's best to imagine a future where this will be part of my life for however long I have life, because I can't, I have to envis envisage a worst case scenario so I can cope with this. And of course, the fact of the matter was that wasn't helping me cope. That was just weighing me down with worry and anxiety and, and fear, again, back to that word. So that's, that's been interesting. That's been a bit of a process. And now that I'm at the end of what the class is, active treatment, I've finished the holy trinity of chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy. I am now at a stage where it's like, okay, what's next? And I've, I've been really, I've been really encouraged this past week to feel that actually I can feel myself thinking about the future. And I have been able to, and I'm not saying I'm going to be able to do this every day because there are good days and there are bad days. Yeah. But on a good day, I am able to compartmentalize it. Cancer is never not going to be part of my life now. There's a lot of milestones still ahead to me I have to get to, so cancer will, will, will be there. It will be one of the boxes in my life that I will have to live with and be aware of and watch out for. But I'm, I'm much more in a place now where it's one of the boxes and there are lots of other boxes with lots of other things in them, friends, family, work church, fun, you know, there's other boxes. Whereas I would have said maybe three, four months ago, cancer felt like the whole box. There was just one giant box and it had the word cancer in it. And it was, it was so hard to think of the future. But I, I think I'm getting there that there's, there is, there's a potential for a future now. Go on, you pick one now. Um, well, uh, I'm curious about that one. How much did death, how much was it on your mind at different times? Quite a lot. Quite a lot. As a Christian, you've got that, oh, I should be joyful about that because I get to go and be with Jesus forever. And, and you want to go, well, yes, of course, that would be fabulous. And you're like, ah, it will be fabulous, wouldn't it? And, and for me, it was a real crystallizing of, wow, you've paid lip service to this whole, you know, my belief in, in my belief in God, my, my belief in Jesus as my savior, my belief in the forgiveness of my sins, my belief in eternal life, you know, means that, you know, death holds no fear for me. And it's like, really? Does it actually hold no fear for you? And that's been quite a, an eye opener to be like, okay, now the rubber hits the road. Do you actually believe this? Can you actually face up to the thought that actually you might not live your three score years and 10? And are you actually okay with that? And the answer at times was no. No, I'm really not. It's been a real revelation to me of, well, what's, what's the state of my relationship with Jesus? Uh -huh. If I'm not actually okay with the thought of, yes, 
you know, I get to lay down the, the turmoil of this life and I get to I get to be with him forever. And it's not wrong to love life. Yeah. You know, we were created to enjoy life. You know, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And and the, this is the first stage of that, is this earthly life. And, and it's not wrong to have relationships with friends and family and that, that you don't want to give up or, or that you can't foresee what a change would look like. It's not wrong to enjoy things like coffee and plants and the sun and, and the thought of leaving this world when it's all we know is quite kind of like ooh. and we also have the very human thing of well will it hurt probably you know it, it probably would hurt it probably would involve suffering and, and there will be the grief of oh I, won't, I wouldn't get to see this happen and I wouldn't get to see you know nephews and nieces grow up and become the men and women God intended them to be but behind it all is the you need to you need to develop your relationship with God to the point where actually death holds no sting. And I suspect for most of us, I, you know, initially I could feel quite guilty about this, but then I'm like, I don't think I'm alone in this. Oh yeah. You know, um, most of us probably are not not right, that ready or don't give it that much thought. There's, I, there's I, still I, things to do. There's still things to do. So I've had the the gift this year of having to think through. What might this be like? I want to keep living with the prospect of death. Um, if that doesn't sound too gloomy, and I don't, no, 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 I don't mean that sense. from a place of fear and worry. I mean from a place of the recognition of this mortal body one day will fail, and there will be something else that will go on for eternity. And am I ready for that? When you'd said that was that was the passage you were going to use, Luke 12. When Jesus said, you know, do it right. I've always loved that passage. I mean, I love the Gospel of Luke anyway. Of all the Gospels, Luke's my, Luke's my man. I, I, the Gospel of Luke is the one that speaks to me. Um, and I've always loved that passage because I've loved that reminder about, you know, look at the birds of the air, look at the flowers of the field. They're not burdened with the same cares we are, and yet God looks after them. And, and I've, loved, I've always loved the, the intimacy of God knows how many hairs are on your head. Because it's like, wow. Well, you get more than, than I do. No, yeah, you know, nobody, <laughs> nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. But God, God knows that, that. That in a vast universe with 7 billion people on the planet, which is a number we actually just can't picture, we have a God who actually knows how many years are on your head. It's been an interesting one, again, to think about over the last yeah. few months, though, because this felt like the, probably one of the biggest things I've ever had in my life to worry about. And I was like, suddenly it's like, do not worry. It's like, hi, hey, very good. How, how, how do I do not worry? And I've actually found myself thinking about it recently too, thinking about when Jesus said that, you know, I was like, was it given to us as a commandment? Is it a commandment, do not worry? Or is it an aspirational teaching? What does Jesus mean when he says do not worry? Does he mean, well, just, just don't worry. Like that's a command, you've not to do it. And if you do do it, are you failing? Are you breaking a commandment? Or is it meant as a, like, I don't, I don't want to misquote scripture here, but you know, there's a little bit, be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect sort of thing. Um, and it's like, and we know that it's like, well, none of us is ever going to be perfect. We can try, we've to, that is what we've to aspire to. We've to aspire to Christ-like holiness. But we all realistically know that none of us will ever actually get there. But that's not to stop, you know, we've still to, we've still to aspire to that. It's to be that reminder during troubled times of, well, look, don't, don't worry about this. Do it. Actually put this into practice. When you've got a bad, you know, a stressful situation or a worrying situation, you have to think about the fact that you're saying, look, don't worry. Even the very hairs in your head are numbered. And I quite like the humour of, even the very hairs in my head are numbered. Even when there is not a single hair left on my head. You know, the follicles are still there. So, you know, it's like, your Heavenly Father knows the number of follicles that are here, there on your head, you know, because there's no actual hairs. Um, it would have been a lot easier to, you know, get the, the, the few eyelashes that were left yeah. at one, one time. Um, God knows that we worry about things. But he does also tell us not to. So I think that's a really important thing to work through with him and go, well, you need to, you need to teach me how to not worry then. Because in human terms, I'm very worried. So teach me how to not worry in spiritual terms. <laughs>